Hi, welcome back to Home Time. We're going to spend the next couple shows doing what you might call a literary restoration of this house in Mankato, Minnesota. This is where the author Maud Hart Lovelace grew up in the late 1890s. Later on, she penned the Betsy Tacey books, which are all about her adventures with the little girl across the street. It's generally known as the Betsy House, and it's prominently featured in the books, both in drawings and in stories. So even though the author moved away 100 years ago, it's always been a shrine for Betsy Tacey fans who come from all over the world to see it. And in 2001, it was purchased by the Betsy Tacey Society, which is based right here in Mankato. A lot of other places have, um, you know, restored uh, authors' homes and things like that. It wasn't in great shape when they got it, it still needs quite a bit of work, but this is the same group that renovated the Tacey House across the street. They did an incredible job on that restoration. They plan doing the same thing on the Betsy House. We would like it for a museum, maybe a place to keep the artifacts and have the TC House as our shop, gift shop. It's challenging and it's rewarding uh, when you take a, an old porch that has aluminum siding on it uh, and restore it. On this show, we'll take a look at what's been done at Tacey's house, we'll see what needs to be done on Betsy's, and we'll get started on the work we want to get done over the next couple of shows. That includes hanging some antique doors, tearing off some mismatched siding, and then prepping new material for installation. Well, we've got the home time crew here, some volunteers from the Betsy Tacey Society, some construction management students from the local university. Stick around. I think you'll enjoy this one. Home Time is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. Ready to help with your next home project. When banks compete for your mortgage, some offers really stand out. You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville. Manufacturers of a complete line of formaldehyde-free fiberglass insulation. Johns Manville. Our focus is insulation. Big doings. I think this is probably the first time a television show has come and filmed in Mankato. Well, we've got some great stories for us. We try to stay out of each other's way doing some demolition, some priming, and some restoration of the porch. Now we will talk about the restoration, but we also want to mix in some stories about the Betsy and Tacey connection as we go on. We have a lot of volunteers here today, uh, some from the local university here in Mankato. We have about 320 students in the program, and we knew that there would be a lot of them interested in, in uh, coming out here to volunteer, so we had to put a limit on it. I uh, grew up about a half a block away, and um, I used to walk by this house every day on my way to uh, elementary school. We also have a uh, bunch of people from the Betsy Tacey Society, which have been spearheading this project to make it really happen. David Lamson is a husband of a board member that we kind of drew in. I've done some painting here, and I've done, replaced some of the window panes here. Joe Flannery, he's a good friend of, of Lona's. and is interested in this type of work and, and preservation of old houses. It's astonishing, you know, with a good crew out here, you can get a lot done in a very short period of time. You know, projects like this are always a, a work of love. Uh, people that are dedicated to society to, you know, make these homes, uh, first of all, happen from the standpoint of being purchased, and then all the work that goes into it. Denny is one of the one of the key guys. He's he's the guy that's making the construction part happen. There was combination combination windows on the whole front porch. The underside of the porch was was rotted, so the whole perimeter of the porch was rebuilt. I had opened it up, I had leveled it, redid the floor, and then had the railings and stuff ready to go, and then we heard that uh, Home Time was interested. So this really moves us ahead. We can start concentrating a little bit more on the inside once we get the outside done. All of the trim in, in the whole house is gone. The floors in there as well. We haven't decided as far as what to do with the living room, dining room. We don't have any original photos. We can only go by some of the descriptions in the books. If you look at the artist's renderings, which help a lot, you can really get a feel for what this was and what then also could be in the future. The beauty is this doesn't have to be a house where somebody lives. They can bring it pretty much back to its original state and uh, they aren't concerned that the, you know, the kitchen has certain food prep areas and all the other stuff. Let, let's, let's get it back original. I, I like that philosophy. 
Well, if you think restoring the Betsy house is a lot of work, well, it's nothing new to these guys. They, about 10 years ago, restored the house across the street, the Tacey house, and it turned out beautifully. We began inside in the, in the parlor in the living room. Uh, there was uh, a lot of paneling. None of the original woodwork was left. Pulled the paneling off, and a lot of the lath and plaster was loose. Uh, replastered it all, put all the woodwork back on. The porches were both enclosed. We opened both of those up. It's so exciting to see the Tacey house because you know that the Betsy house could and will be like that someday. He really did a great job at, at putting things back to that time period. It's been just so much fun to watch the progression. We've you know, that was 95, so 10 years we've been working on that. Well, on the porch, the next big job that we have going is um, replacing an existing door with something that's a little bit more appropriate and then rehanging one that was actually covered over years ago. When Maud lived here, there were two, two doorways, the one going into the parlor and then this one coming into the dining room. This door just got blocked off. We're going to reinstall this door, make it bigger for a 3 old door using an old door so I gotta rip it all apart, recut everything, rehang an old door. The door that's on there now is kind of a craftsman style door, which really doesn't fit the uh, era of the house. And so they're gonna be replacing that with something that they found at the salvage yard, kind of more of a Victorian style. It's gonna fit much, much better with the house. Well, first of all, I gotta secure this and level this up, pull this door off. I'll have to shim that floor up to get it so it has clearance on the bottom. We're gonna put a, a new threshold in there. Uh, this door has to be trimmed down. I'll cut it off the bottom. Then we'll have to uh, put the hinges on. This will be the exterior of the door, so we will swing it the same way as it is swinging now and open up into the room this way. First of all, we're going to take this old sheeting off carefully. I'm going to bang it off from the inside edge and take it from the outside and just kind of crank it off. We're going to reuse some of the, some of the pieces. Better, Dave? Hang on. There you go. Is that old base? It kind of looks like it. It's like they chucked up the old base in the house and stuck it in here. <laughs> the door had one nail in, in the head jam. I guess they figured the plaster on the inside and the trim held it in. We're using an, an old door that they found and they had. It's Let's bigger uh, than what the jam was. So now I gotta tear apart the jam, cut a new headpiece, route it out, and then hopefully we'll put in the new opening. Hopefully it'll work. Basically, we've been doing things as the society can afford to do it. They can't lay out $10,000 at, at one shot. They, they wait until they get a few thousand. We do a small part of it. And that's how we've progressed so far. Now we don't have to nail this very well because the casing will actually hold it on on the outside. But I'll put a few nails in there just to hold it. We're removing a little siding here because, uh, well first of all, around the corner of the house we have some siding that absolutely doesn't match up to anything. It's not just lap siding. It's some. Uh, Cheap plywood somebody installed it trying to do it on the on the cheap evidently. Over here we're going to be replacing a couple windows and by the time we get things reframed and the new windows in, uh, that combined with the fact that siding's really old, it really makes sense I think just to pull the old stuff off. One thing we could do is try to save the siding, which uh, is always nice, but I'll tell you we're going to end up with so many short little pieces it probably won't fit in the final analysis. That combined with the fact this this must be the old, the old original siding, and some of it is not in real great shape. So I think really the, the most efficient thing to do is just haul this off, put some new stuff on. My job today is to get this siding kind of cleaned up. This stuff was taken from the porch. Dennis took it off. It came off fairly easily and we're hoping to salvage it and put it back on the porch. So trying to get all the paint off it in big globs using this scraper. We'll just rough up the surface just enough so that the primer will stick 
really well to it. Once I have it started scraped down, I'm gonna switch over to the palm sander. Safety first, this is probably not new paint, so it's probably some lead in there. I'm just gonna take my orbital sander. This is a fairly rough paper. Start sanding away. Starting on the project, it reminded me a lot of a Habitat for Humanity project where you have a lot of volunteers. Everybody's ready to go. We got a lot of good raw talent. But uh, we don't always uh, necessarily have the perfect spots to plug everybody in. So a big part of the job is just getting everybody doing something that seems to work and, and not having anybody uh, tripping over anybody else or, or hurting anybody. And, and once we were at that point, we started getting some things accomplished. When there's four or five people around that kind of know what they're doing, things move along quite swiftly. These students here, most of them have done roofing, framing. Uh, almost all of their experience has been uh, residential, so they've worked on houses, either new construction or renovation. So for a lot of them, this, is, this isn't the first time, but it's exciting for them to be working with home time and exciting to be working on uh, this, this landmark here in Mankato at the Betsy Pacey House. Of course, anybody coming to one of these projects has to bring what? Donuts. Well, besides donuts, I mean, oh. tool belts are an absolute necessity. Yeah. Of course, the different people, a tool belt will mean different things. Uh, a good tool belt is one that isn't wore out and doesn't have a lot of holes in it so you don't dribble nails all over. <laughs> Something that holds a hammer, or two hammers in this case. <laughs> Some people like a simple belt. A couple of pockets, holds the basic tools, it, it just gets the job done. And of course, some people like to take their entire workshop and wear it around their waist. This is uh, what Lenny likes to use. Dean's right. I like a belt with lots of pockets. Outside pockets, inside pockets, pockets for all your little hand tools. If you have them, you're going to use them. And even uh, a little area right back in here for his uh, 10 a.m. sandwich. Once in a while, Lenny. Once in a while. On the other end of the spectrum are one of these canvas aprons. You get these for under a buck. This is what Lona likes to wear. Now, I do say wear. I haven't uh, seen her use it a whole lot yet. What I like to work with is one of these leather aprons. I like everything on the front, very easy to get at, hammer right here on the side. Now Lenny likes to stick his hammer in the back. Uh, it's all personal preference. I personally have uh, been liking wearing this backwards. I like having my tape measure on my back, so when I lean up against stuff, I'm not hitting everything in the pockets. So. I use the uh, belt that holds up my pants, and that's about it. I might stuff a, uh, a tool in my pocket or two, and that I, I go the light end approach. A lot of people like these web belts. I like the new comfort belts. Two piece, cushioned, it, it makes these big belts ride really easy. Right now I'm using one with two pouches and that it just, if I have one that hangs in front of me, I can't see it because of this thing. Oh, it's great that there's so many options. These pockets slide on and off the belt. This is one for an electrician. This would be a pocket for a framer. They even have cordless drill holders. You can slide your cordless drill in there. It makes it easy to get it. Even something for the cell phone. And what's interesting, you show up on a project like this, you probably won't see two people with the same rig on. Well, I like one that has suspenders on it, just so that it's kind of holds itself up a little bit. I like the soft material in a lot of pockets. I went through several through the years. Uh, these newer ones have uh, kind of a cordura material. The old ones had leather. Uh, th these are nice. Uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of sold on. They're kind of big, but you know, get a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, sometimes you got to dig down deep to find what you're looking for, like uh, the Tootsie Rolls here. My advice is talk to some of your friends, see what they're wearing, come in, try some of these on, get something that's comfortable, then go out and have some fun with it. So here we'll just clean it up. Here we'll take it back. Oh, I don't know, to here, foot and a half or so. We're using an, an old door that they found. It's bigger than what the jam was. We're going to make a brand new opening. Dave is going to take out the plaster. And then we'll kind of surgically put in a new stud and trimmer, new header, and, and then we'll cut the lath from the inside, we'll cut the ship out from the outside. We're going to have to fur up the floor and go up and set the new jam and door and sill right on top of the existing oak. We took the existing jam out of the opening, put a new headpiece in, a brand new sill, grabbing it out for a much thicker door. This new door is an inch and three quarter door. We, we flopped the door for a different swing. So I'm, I'm morsing off the existing door in the brand new jam here. The key to a good mortise is actually to make sure that your hinge lays flat. You, you gotta have it flat. If it's pinched, it'll swing that door crooked. It's always tough you have an existing door and you're taking the hinges off that, putting on a jam that doesn't have any margin at all. So 
You know, the classic line, measure twice, cut once. So I measured three times and only have to cut twice, so. The door was a little long for, or a little tall for the opening. So I think with the threshold that we put down, I probably cut maybe an inch or so off the bottom of the door to fit it. Uh, Width-wise, it, it fit the opening very well. I uh, hinged the door according to the hinge marks that were on one of the side jams. I put three hinges on the door instead of the two that were there. So the hinges on the jam lined up with the hinges on the door so I didn't have to fill the old jam hinge holes. Norm Abram would have a, a type of thing where, where he would just chunk it out with a motorized deal, I guess. But we'll just chip it out with a chisel. It's fun to be involved with the construction management folks because it's a great programming, teaching, teaching these young kids how to manage large construction projects. I've got Chris and Mike working with me. So Chris, what, uh, what technique do you like to use for hauling this stuff off? Well, depending on uh, how, what kind of shape it's in, uh, <laughs> the quicker the better sometimes. So this has to be a pretty good uh, practice session for you to get out and actually work on an old house like this, isn't it? I am well versed in working in old renovated areas like this. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a nice practice um, to help out uh, with an establishment like the Betsy Casey Foundation. Now, living next door, you probably heard of the series, right? Oh, sure, yeah. sure. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the local public library has a whole section of the library dedicated to Betsy Casey. Well, we have the Maude Hart Lovelace mural, which was done by our local artist, Marian Anderson, which depicts some of the landmarks and scenes from the Betsy Casey books. We also have a display case in which we have books that were originally in circulation that we've since taken out of circulation that are signed by Maud Hart Lovelace. And also in the display case, we have the picture that TC gave Betsy for a birthday present. We also have artwork that people find fascinating. It's the original artwork by Lois Lenski. She was the original artist for the Betsy Casey book, and we have those displayed on the wall above the case. We have visitors from the East Coast, the West Coast, and actually from other countries that come here to visit the sites that basically to relive uh, the books. This kind of brings back memories being here actually because my mother and I took a field trip down here when I was probably about 10 or 11 to see the Betsy house and see the Tacy house and the big hill and, and all the things that are in the books. Mankato is Deep Valley in the books. Yes, yeah, she called Mankato Deep Valley. And of course that's, that's because of the beautiful uh, river valley that we've got here. And we have the bench up at the end of Center Street where Maude would tell stories to her friends. And then the big hill is, is East Lewis Street. And all that was atop that hill was one farmhouse, Mrs. Ekstrom's house. People like to also go up to the Glenwood Cemetery where Maude is buried. It's amazing how the books are so um, meaningful to people. Uh, whether they read them in their childhood or now, they really have a deep connection to that and they want to see where this happened. I got involved with the Betsy Tasty books because I grew up in Mankato, had rheumatic fever when I was nine years old, and consequently had to be tutored. I was at home for a year, and my tutor made this as part of my mandatory reading. And so that's how I became acquainted with them. And uh, once I started reading them, I, I, I thought they were captivating. You know, it's nothing I would tell my uh, other 10-year-old uh, uh, buddies about. But uh, over the years, it was always fun bumping into other people who have read the books. I got the hinges mortised in. They're actually installed. They've got the opening all prepped. The uh, house itself is settled a little bit, so it's not yeah. plumb. Cut this first piece, fit down onto the, actually it sets on the joist of the building. And this final piece, I cut, set in, so that it levels the bottom of the door off. And now we're going to see if, if everything works. I'm going to test it first before we get all rammed up. If it's going to work, then we're going to set the door in. All right. A lot of times you don't know what you have to do until you tear things apart. But uh, that's just all part of it. It's uh, enjoyable. Sometimes it's a little more work than one would think. But <laughs> I think these Betsy Tacy homes have a lot of interest in the community here. I think uh, you know people in the community are really proud of the fact that these happen in the Mankato area. 
And so now that we've been kind of uh, mowing around here for a while today, we see the uh, local media stopping by, a lot of uh, neighbors as well as just people that have heard that this is going on have been stopping by just to check it out. Well, Dean is from Mankato, so we just thought we'd swing down and pick up something to see what he's doing down here. If you just look around, you see a lot of uh, uh, kibitzers, you know, people watching this, and I think they're taking a lot of pride in the fact that this is being done. It's really exciting. <laughs> they're for excited them. about Betsy Casey. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, we've we've been a part of the Betsy Casey Society. Well, she has been all her life, and I met Maud back in the '70s when she was still alive. So I've been doing Betsy Casey things in Mankato. And my grandfather, Jab Lloyd, uh, had his name transposed to Cab the book, so uh, he is the character Cab in the Betsy Tacey books. When I was a young boy, at four years old, I moved into this house and stayed here until I was about 11. I didn't have any idea that she lived in here, of course. She didn't have her stories out at that time, but uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. I made a little donation to it, but uh, I'd like to make some more donation to it. <laughs> and I think it's very nice to have history. We're at the moment of truth where we got the jam that we built hanging, that the uh, inside is in, and we're gonna set the door. So Dave's hoping I didn't screw up. The other door actually was a salvage door out of a house in town that was gonna get uh, torn down as well. well. Working with old doors like this is, uh, is never real easy. And of course, we're trying to fit doors that uh, you know originally weren't here. And uh, actually, Dennis even had to kind of rework some of these to get everything to, to fit. But it's going to be very much in keeping with what was originally here at the turn of the century. Well, we got two out of three hinges. I nailed the top one, nailed the center. The bottom one's off about a sixteenth, so I got to take it down just a little smidge. Okay, we've got uh, everything cut to uh, fit here for the most part just while all of our hinges are in except for this uh, third one. We may have to take a little bit more off the door to get it to fit this threshold and then, uh, then we're ready for a doorknob. Perfect. Now we're going to hang it like we normally do. We'll, we'll hang the jam matching the door to see if it fits, huh? What the hell did I do, Dave? I screwed up. He's either going to have to put in some really heavy duty weather stripping on the one side or they're going to have to cut that jam down a little bit. I was just I was just telling Dave that usually when I make a mistake is if when you burn an inch and then you forget to add it in and uh, that's kind of that's kind of what I did. Well when I do a lot of work you want to be pretty accurate on I burn an inch which means you, you measure from the inch line of your tape and the trick is, is, to, is to remember that you did it and of course when I built the jam, I forgot to take it out and the whole jam was an inch wide. I've had to take things apart myself. What can you do as long as you can repair it? Uh, you know, everybody's going to make a mistake, I guess. A good carpenter always hides his mistakes. My dad said, if you, if you, never, if you never made a mistake, you never work. So I guess I must work a little because I do make mistakes once in a while. So I'll hang the door and Dave will put the pins in. And once we saw the two doors up, I mean, it, it's just fun. We realized, okay, great, and we're, we're, we're starting to dig in on this thing, and, and we're making some headway. And, and it's nice because you look into that corner, and you have two, two I can't say brand new doors, but two doors sitting in their positions that it, it really starts looking, period. Having it restored historically accurate is, is very exciting. It's just a whole new place. <laughs> It's been a lot of fun so far and we've gotten quite a bit accomplished. All the sidings off, our doors are in, and we made some pretty good progress on the priming. And we've also gotten a sense of what the Betsy Tacey connection means to the people of Mankato, why they're so willing to put their time and energy working on a house like this. So for the last bit of remodeling, we're going to be putting on siding, installing some windows a little bit more reminiscent of an 1890s house with some old storm windows, redoing the old concrete stoop. So until then, for the Home Time Gang, the Betsy Tacey Society, and all the guys from the university, thanks for watching and we will see you next time. Visit Home Time at PBS Online. We've got more details about our projects, tips on owning and maintaining a home, and a great glossary of building terms. Stop by and see us at pbs.org. Home Time is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. Ready to help with your next home project. When banks compete for your home equity loan, some offers really shine. 
You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville, manufacturers of a complete line of formaldehyde-free fiberglass insulation. Johns Manville. Our focus is insulation. Hi, welcome back to Home Time. We're in Mankato, Minnesota, where there's an ongoing project to restore the childhood home of author Maud Hart Loveless. Now, this is a home that's prominently featured in the popular Betsy Casey book series that she wrote back in the early 1940s. Maud's family moved away more than 100 years ago, but this house, the Betsy House, is a real landmark for Betsy Casey fans all over, including the Casey House across the street. Now, both houses are owned by the Betsy Casey Society. They've already restored the Casey House. Now it's time to start work on the Betsy House. Last time we gave you an idea of the home's current condition, which wasn't great, but they've given it a new roof, bolstered the foundation, and started restoring the front porch. We ripped off some old siding, got the porch siding ready to be reinstalled, and we hung a couple of antique doors, more in keeping with the home's 1892 pedigree. We also met Denny Weiss, a local remodeler who's been doing most of the restoration work up to this point. We worked with volunteers from the Construction Management Program at the Minnesota State University at Mankato and met the local people who've been driving the Betsy Tacey Restorations, the Betsy Tacey Society. It's a great thing for the society. The girls are in Southern Calvin. There's just so much that needs to be done. I just can't imagine that it could come this far. This is what's exciting to us, is to be able to bring this house back and make it look turn of the century. It's preserving them the character and the quality that you just can't get today. On this show, we want to finish priming the new siding, replace all the siding we've taken off, rebuild the front stairs to finish up the porch, and turn back the clock a little by restoring a couple of windows to something a lot closer to what they were in the 1890s. It's a big chunk of work for one show, but with the home time crew, the Betsy Tacey volunteers, Denny, and all the guys from the university, I think we'll pull it up. Stick around and see what happens. Home Time is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. Ready to help with your next home project. When banks compete for your mortgage, some offers really stand out. You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville. Manufacturers of a complete line of formaldehyde-free fiberglass insulation. Johns Manville. Our focus is insulation. Okay, so we're going to crank this guy up. Okay, we've got a good group of volunteers here today. The first thing we want to do is get rid of this step. A, a precast concrete stoop probably isn't the way they'd handle it back in the 1890s. And the discussion was, do we drag it right. and give this to somebody, or do we bust oh, nice. it in place, or do we drag it and tip it and then bust it. 
I think everybody realized this thing's a lot heavier than we thought it was going to be, but uh, the plan now is just to bust this thing up, throw it in the dumpster. We thought we'd maybe haul it down the front and have somebody haul it away, but uh, I think uh, we're just going to get rid of it. The new stairway is going to be how the old stairway used to be. We're going to match what was originally here. There's a nice wood steps, closed uh, risers, nice wood treads matching railings, kind of bring it back in, on, on what the house used to look like. I thought it might be core fill, but it wasn't, so cement broke up real easy, not much rebar in it, so broke broke up real nice. Time to clean it up. Throw her in the dumpster. Windows are always a big issue on historical restorations, especially on modest homes like this, where people have put in smaller, less expensive replacement windows, or even covered up old windows entirely, like the one on the porch. This is the old window opening. They found it when they took off the siding. We're gonna be getting rid of these studs, take care of this wall here, and we're gonna put in a new window. Reopening that old space for the window on that front porch was fun. Knocking out the two by fours was great. Here she comes. And very easy to cut through with drywall. It's much better than lack of blaster. Okay, so this is what I've done. I've cut all the way around. I just have this last piece to do. I just want to make sure nobody's in here, just in case it comes flying into the room. All of a sudden, here I was with just one little corner holding it in, and as soon as that corner was gone, I knew I was gonna, it was going to start falling in, so it did. Oh, nice catch, Denny. <laughs> you know, when we popped that hole in the wall, it, it just There's transformed that uh, dining room. It, ah, it allowed so much it. more light to come in. Uh, it created a whole different look from the exterior as well. Immediately right there you have all of a sudden there's an opening, there's light coming in. Having this not here really changes the look of it. It's going to be really great to have a window here. We're moving right along here at our stairs. Dave actually took all the old trim out and kind of got it back to, to, to the basic structure of the porch. We're going to beef it up so it's ready to accept our new stairs. I, I cut a pattern piece for our new jacks, checked it, made sure it was level, passable, it is. So I'm going to cut three more pieces and then we'll, we'll make one big stair, slide it in, screw it to our new framing, and hopefully everything works out. Taking it all out at once here. Boy, I, I've been working on these windows off and on for two weeks now. I, I think I know what I've got. I think they're going to work. One challenge in doing a restoration like this is what do you do for windows? You know, you can't go out and buy an 1890s window. So uh, what we do have is a lot of the windows in the home are original, so we know exactly what we've got. This is one of the modern windows, not real attractive. You can see it's a little smaller. The original rough opening can be seen down here. They filled in this framing here, a little framing up on top. In fact, if you look over here, this is the original size of the rough opening, a lot more attractive. Uh, Denny had built windows for the Tacy house across the street basically the same type of window and so we just mimic that same type of design yeah. use the same sort of materials and uh, we were ready to uh, assemble something that looks very much like I think what the carpenters installed back at the turn of the century. Okay so this is our window unit going in place. You can see it has a much different look than our modern window. I mean what a difference to look at this uh, this modern window compared to the original rough opening with that uh, that old-fashioned style. Now the problem here of course is you can't go out and buy an 1890s window. We had to build these. So the first stop was, then he contracted with a local shop to fabricate sashes that are just about identical to the sashes in this house. Well, I think it has a lot of historical significance uh, in Mankato, the Betsy Tacy house. We do a lot of old preservation work that nobody else wants to do anymore, but we make the old-fashioned storm windows and the old-fashioned sashes. When we get the order in, we look at the sizing of it, and we have standard sizes in our bins that we buy the parts uh, already mortised and tenon. But many times, the standard size is not the one they need, so it's got to be a custom size. So we select the right, the closest size to a standard, then we end cut the, uh, the mortise and tenon off there, and then we have to run it to the mortise and tenon machine so we can put that same ending on it again. And that takes some work. It's a very time-consuming process. It's manual labor. Setting up the punch to the center bar. These guys know what they're doing, and so uh, I couldn't build the sash myself, but uh, I know they can, they could do a much better job than even if I knew how to build it. The customer will give us what bevel they want, and then we will take that bottom rail piece, and we will put the correct bevel on that so it matches the original framing of the home. Then we make sure we've got all the parts there, and we put the mortise and tenon together to then make a unit. 
and then we put it in the frame square and we put the parts together and we nail them. Now it's assembled basically, but we gotta put the glass in. So we go over there and we put a, a bed of silicone on the wood and we hand cut the glass, unless it's a large, if it's a large quantity of them, we will cut it on the computer saw. But in this case, it's hand cut. We lay the glass in there. The glass then is adhered to the sash, the wood sash itself, so it's not gonna go any place. And it also keeps the water out. So we either putty it, if it's a true divided light, which many of these are, then we putty them. And those stops and we'll cover up the silicone that's on there and it'll give it a nice look. What we wanna do with them is try and get back to the original as close as we could, and we specialize in that. Once the sash was taken care of, then we had to decide what kind of frame are we going to build around this so the window looks exactly like the rest of the windows here in the house. Our question was, what kind of wood are we going to use? One option would be clear pine. Now, this is a really high quality wood. It's very clean, no knots, easy to work with, but it can be kind of expensive, especially when you're talking about the thicker stocks that you need for window frames. Well, lower grade pine is less expensive and it's good for framing and lower visibility jobs, but it tends to have more knots and it's usually not quite as straight, so it's not quite right for a millwork job. Pressure treated wood is perfect for outdoor applications like fences and decks because of its resistance to insects and decay, but it tends to be a little bit damp still from the treatment process and we need it dry for priming and painting. Plus, this isn't usually used for indoor projects like woodwork for windows. Another option would be Douglas fir, which is less expensive than clear pine and takes paint really well. Plus, it's what Denny used rebuilding the windows of the Tacy house, so that's our choice as well. We're using uh, framing lumber and deck lumber, and we're making the frames for our windows, and they're, the style is a double hunk. This is our nice little shop here. So I've got a, a chop saw to do our uh, cutting lengths, and then we use a table saw to do our bevels and our rips. Now we're going to work on our side jams, and we're going to cut a little bit of a, a dado into the side of these jams. So we're putting a 15 degree uh, cut on our uh, jam and we're going to plow out all of this in here. Uh, the sills always have to drain water. It rains, you got to have the water dripping outward. So we're putting a 15 degree pitch on our sill and that will act as a drip edge, so to speak. I got little ridges in that, so I just want to take the chisel and clear it, clean it out on the bottom there. The old double hung windows require a piece of molding known as the parting stop. Now this is what holds the uh, upper and lower sashes right in place. They do still stock this, which is good because we're going to need a couple pieces. But traditionally this is cut right into the jam using a dado blade. To really score some points for historical accuracy, you got to have a traditional wood storm window as well. Now these are traditionally held right onto the window jam with a little piece of hardware called a turn button. So there's six of these per window. Let's grab some of these and we're good to go. Okay, we're ready for assembly. We're uh, pre-drilling, counter sinking, and then we're going to screw it together. This really gives you a pretty good idea how to reproduce an old-fashioned window frame. Well, it certainly is a bit of work, but we still have a little bit here yet to do on site. One thing we're doing is just kind of tweaking the size of these so everything fits in the openings. And uh, what we're doing right now is putting in this parting step, so next thing we'll be ready for sashes. What's, what's kind of weird about uh, putting together windows like this is we aren't worried so much about the energy efficiency. We're more worried about matching exactly what's in the house. That's a little trial and error putting these things together. Uh, the sashes are very close, but uh, just a little tight. We want these to be able to operate. And if they're too wide and they're just barely fitting in our frame, they're just they're always going to be kind of hung up in there. And this is our lower sash. There's a lot of pieces here, and, and we cut a couple corners here. Uh, for example, we don't have the weights on here, the counterweights and that. But they are not going to be operating quite like, it's, a, it's not exact replica of an old double hung. It's real close. So. I think any of the students that were here that have worked on residential projects before are used to uh, hefting up some vinyl windows into a window opening. And they think they were surprised at both the, the bulk of it and at the, the complexity of how many parts and pieces there were to it. And uh, it felt good to them to put in something that was that solidly made. All right, then we just pop our storm window right exactly where it should go on the frame, nail on our side casing, pop this one up here, and then we can put it in the opening. Ooh, ooh, ouch. 
Oh, man. I'll get you, Judd. It was a lot of fun once we got the windows all assembled. You stand back and you take a look at them and you feel like you're just about in the time warp that you created something that uh, you know might have been used 100 years ago. So now we just pop this in the opening. And I have to think this is a lot closer to what the carpenters probably installed in the house back in 1892. And this is definitely the sort of look that they're going for in restoring this, this entire house. That looks pretty nice, Judd. The people right away would see it and said, hey, this is looking nice. They, they liked it, and it made me, obviously it made me feel good. I am so amazed with the job that they've done with the windows. It just, I never would imagine that it could look like it does in there. To go back and, and restore this historically is, is really great to see. It sticks real well with leaves. Finally on our treads and risers, we're, we're using duck fur for the treads, cedar for the risers, cedars for our poles. Everything's really nice and solid. I had to notch the second tread around my poles and the agent gave me a hand to get this thing in. You ready? So hopefully it'll drop right in, Dave. Dennis had a definite idea on, on how he wanted that stair to be. He wanted closed risers, he wanted closed sides so no mice or anything could get underneath the porch. Explained what I wanted. He said, sounds good. He whipped them up in no time, and uh, well, he might have taken them a little time, but uh, he got them put together, and they look great. I'm working with the ladies, priming. Lily and Bucky and I, a few other people, are kind of getting the siding ready to go on here. What we're doing is we're actually replacing a lot of it with this new um, western red cedar. It's a tight knotted cedar. It's a renewable resource, and it's really durable and stands up to the elements very well. Well, what we're doing to this cedar to prep it to go on the house is we're actually putting a coat of latex uh, primer on it. It's tinted so it'll match the color of the house. And this is going to help seal the wood and then take the finished coats a lot easier. I'm on the uh, second phase of the operation. Miriam and Lillian are doing the back side and uh, I'm doing the front side. All I do is slop some on the roller, head over here and kind of slop some on this way and then go back and spread it out, making sure I don't spill too much down the edge. Well, I had moved to Mankato a year and a half ago and joined the Betsy Tasty Society last winter. So I found out they were going to start renovating this house, and that's what I was interested in was helping with that. There's just a feeling in old houses that you just can't get in a new house, and I really appreciate that. Okay, things are moving along here. We got our tar paper up, all the windows are in, and we're moving on to the siding. The trick here is how do you lay the siding up on this wall when nothing's level? The foundation certainly isn't level. The fascia is all over the place. So what we're doing is, first of all, we lay the first course right along the foundation. And then as we work up toward the window, we just start adjusting everything to get it to a level position. Because once the siding hits the windows, we want it to be level. Otherwise, it looks terrible up against these windows. The new and the old siding are going to look just beautiful. I mean, this, this is a great product. It's amazing that, uh, uh, you know, the siding will last as long as it does on these homes when you're using, a, a, you know, an oil-resistant uh, siding that, uh, you know, resists decay and, and that sort of thing. And uh, this stuff will be up here for another 100 years. Well, we have uh, our university help here today, and I'll tell you, it's been great because we've been getting a lot accomplished. I don't know what we do with uh, folks like Brittany and Ryan here helping out. Okay. We've got... Uh, quite a few women in the program, but not as many as we'd like. It's it's a, a career choice that a lot of young women and high school seniors don't don't see as as an option for them. Well, we got off to a little bit of a slow start trying to get everything leveled out, but uh, things are moving along pretty well now. We're using some of our newer, longer links right over here because we have some of the big long runs up by the front porch. We'll recycle some of the older siding we tore off the house. It'll work up there just fine. But I think. Uh, now that we're, we're up and rolling, we should have this thing wrapped up in no time. We finished up the framing of the windows, got the casing on, got the molding. I got to put the molding back on this one here. Got the molding over the doors, these two doors here. This is siding that I uh, salvaged off of this enclosed porch. With all the volunteers got this all primed up and painted, and, and now we're putting it back on. We got a lot of short pieces here. There's all this 24 to 30 inch pieces. We had uh, four longer pieces on the bottom. We got to start in a corner. They're siding the south side, so we marked the corner with a story pole. 
uh, and that marks the different courses of siding. So we're coming off of that corner, we're leveling across. Where is that little nail gun? And we're just going to pack it in place for now. And we'll come back, get another one of them. And you just keep repeating that process all the way up. Uh, we're just prepping these uh, windows to put in the new storm windows. We're going to take off the old stop and uh, scrape the paint off and put in some different stops so the new window sits flush with the casing. A lot of years of paint on there. The windows we're putting in, we'll probably have to trim a little bit. The windows are made square now, the new ones. The openings probably are not Ooh, perfectly square we'll anymore, so we'll have to set them a couple times, trim a little bit off here and there. We've made a couple marks where it's tight because our window opening has a little bow to it. We're going to try just to plane a little bit from here to here. Try it again. Could this be it? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it would probably help if we put it in the right way, huh? Uh, I think we got it. It was like our 10th try. And we're on to the next one, I believe. Hey. What do you think? Okay, Dan's working on the railing now. This is wet paint here, Dan. And uh, it's a pretty simple process. Um, it's going to actually reflect this railing that Denny put on a few weeks ago on the porch with the 2x4 rails and the 2x2 two spindles. Now putting a little primer on the steps. It's a pretty simple detail. We have our bottom rail, our, our fillet top and bottom. So we have a spindle in, the, in between. Piece goes underneath the 2x4. And that 2x4 goes, mat matches the points and just goes ceiling across the top of the poles. And that's about it. Spacing, we have to hit the new code. So spacing has to be 4 inches and under. And I ended up being right around three and a half, three and seven sixteenths, just to make the spacing work. And he adds this four inch space between the spindles and the six inch space underneath the bottom cap or the bottom rail. Now we're gonna finish it up with our top cap. Um, looking back at the whole thing, uh, what the concrete used to look like, it was a pre-cast, pre-formed with metal railings, didn't fit, nothing really hit. And this, this fits the style of the house a lot better. At first, I thought we might have some problems accomplishing what we were setting out to do, but it looks like if the rain holds off, we're gonna we're gonna be real close. Boy, is it nice to see so much work being done, and everyone is is working together, and it's working so smoothly, and it's nice to see so many things happening quickly because we're used to it being slower. Students Dan and Ryan were wonderful. They came early. They put an extra time. It was actually real helpful because they came out in shifts. They were very knowledgeable, a lot of them, and they helped out a tremendous amount. We got a lot uh, accomplished with their help, and it was uh, just kind of fun to talk to them. To look at an older house, see how it has been done, see how it has been updated and changed, and then to see the right way to put it back and, and historically restore it is something that they, they would not have gotten in the classroom and may not have gotten anywhere else if they weren't able to be part of this project. If I could find volunteer labor like that to work on my jobs, I would take them every day. <laughs> well, it took us a couple hours to get the siding up over here, and then we used what was left to take care of this area that once had the old plywood. So it's great to get that old plywood off and some nice looking cedar siding up. I enjoy uh, doing stuff like this. It's kind of a privilege in a way to work on a piece of history. Oh, It's not just some remodel on a uh, 50s Rambler. It looks like someone cares again. Someone cares that they're going to bring this house back to, to in its glory when it was built. How's that? It's a wonderful proposition keeping these homes going, purchasing them, uh, restoring them, because uh, who knows what could happen to these things uh, if, if they continue you know, being passed down through other buyers. Well, everything went great. We had really good luck over the last couple days finishing up what we'd set out to do. We basically wanted to help Dennis and the Betsy Tacy uh, gang finish up most of the exterior work before winter came. When we got here, there were a lot of things not quite right with the house. The siding was, was worn and rotted and coming apart. The windows weren't quite the right size. They didn't fit with the air of the house. The concrete steps didn't look right either. That really needed to be changed. And there were some doors and windows missing that we'd really like to put back. And now we've got new siding that blends in perfectly with the old siding. We have wooden steps that are much more in keeping with the time period of the house. And we've added doors and windows that match the time period correctly. 
more work has been done than we would have been able to do in months and months. It's astonishing, you know, with a good crew out here, you can get a lot done in a very short period of time. I think it's just really a, a good project. As far as uh, renovating older houses, I think it's very important that, you know, no matter what you do, it looks like it was always there. By seeing the outside looking this nice, it does make me very eager to get in and um, start working with the inside. If we can have it as our artist Cheryl Harness that drew the pictures of how we want it to look, it's a little easier for me now to visualize what it might look like once we do have some of those projects underway. Mod Heart Lovelace is the Mankato writer, I think, to anyone who's grown up here, spent time here, and she will always play a really important role in, in the history of the town. Well, we made some pretty good progress on the exterior work, the childhood home of author Maud Hart Lovelace. Hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea what this literary restoration is all about. There is still a lot of work yet to do on the inside, and who knows, maybe if everything works out all right, we'll be back for a, another round of restoration. But until then, we want to thank all the volunteers. For the Hometime Crew, I'm Dean Johnson. And I'm Miriam Johnson. Thanks for watching. Go get some cake. One, two, three. Look at all the spit. All right. Way to go, guys. Visit Home Time at PBS Online. We've got more details about our projects, tips on owning and maintaining a home, and a great glossary of building terms. Stop by and see us at pbs.org. Home Time is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. Ready to help with your next home project. When banks compete for your home equity loan, some offers really shine. You can compare up to four customized offers at LendingTree and choose the one that's right for you. 1-800-555-TREE. When banks compete, you win. LendingTree.com. And by Johns Manville. Manufacturers of a complete line of formaldehyde-free fiberglass insulation. Johns Manville. Our focus is insulation.